you. Before, before I introduce all the people with me at this table, I'd like to acknowledge the presence in the room of uh, other actors and talents from uh, uh, Crimes of the Future. We have the actor and actresses in the first row. Uh, Don McKellar, Nadia Litz, Welked Bunge, Lee Kornowski, Denis Capesa, Yorgos Pirpasopoulos, the producer Panos Papadis, and the co-executive producer and French distributor, Victor Adida. And with us at the table, we have on the other side over there, the producer of the film, Robert Lentos. We have Kristen Stewart. Vigo Mortensen. We come back right here with Monsieur Scott Pittman. Friedman. <laughs> Lea Sidou. And a gentleman who probably has the word cinema tattoo on each of his organs, Monsieur David Cronenberg. <laughs> We have a lot of questions, so I'm going to open the floor to questioning in a minute. But I want to start with you, Monsieur Cronenberg. Uh, in 1983, you ended one of your most iconic movie, Videodrome, by this dialogue, Long Live the New Flesh. So, uh, almost 40 years later, you're coming back to the New Flesh. Uh, why is that? Is it a continuation? Is it something you wanted to talk about, or you've seen the evolution in the real world of what you announced, you're visionary, monsieur. So what, well, why is it coming back? Yeah, um, it's all accidental. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's not like I have an agenda uh, of discussing anything particularly, really. In each case, each film is a separate entity, and I know the films will connect, and I know many people see things in Crimes of the Future that they see in other films like Videodrome and existence. But when I was writing this script, I'm not thinking about those other films at all. Uh, I, I just, I know that there will be connections because it's coming from my own, you know, nervous system. But, um, and when I'm making the film, I'm only thinking about this film as, as an entity on its own. I, I'm not really thinking about other films at all or references to other films, even though I know those connections will be there. But creatively, they don't really give me anything, you know. So when I'm working with Vigo, Kristen, Scott, where I'm just looking at the actors, trying to make them good, you know, <laughs> trying desperately to get a performance out of them, and um, using any weaponry at my no, okay. So um, this is a, a, an old rap that Vigo and I had long ago about how I have to be cruel to my actors, but actually. You, you know, when you have great actors who you, you, they didn't need very little directing, frankly, and um, and I know that's not exactly the, an answer to your question, but it's it's something. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. It's good. I think we have Jason over there. Hi, Jason Gore from Canada, David. Congratulations, congratulations on the film. Once a lifetime ago, you were asked to do Top Gun and turned it down. Top Gun played here. It's a movie about the past, about how the old dogs are the ones who are going to take on the mission. Your film's about the future. It's about no matter how old we, how long we hold on to the past, the future is going to be the art that we actually make. I'm just wondering if you could talk about what you're working on now after your novel, the films you're continuing to do, and for the actors, the word Cronenberg means something. I'm wondering if you could each uh, discuss what it means for you to be a Cronenberg film, maybe the first film of his that you saw, and what drew you to actually work on this project. So first to David and then so to So that's the 10 questions. <laughs> <laughs> and you're only allowed one. And now you're only allowed half of one. Um, what was the first one? <laughs> I can't Top remember. Gun. Top, gun. Uh, yeah. Top Gun. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in the past, when I had a career, people offered me stuff. <laughs> um, and uh, although I like machinery, I mean, I had, I had done a, a movie called Fast Company that nobody talks about, but it's really quite a, a, a sweet movie for me. Uh, about drag racing, these huge monster cars that had 3,000 horsepower, and they drag drag racers in the in the American West, basically. 
Uh, so I could see why they might think, because of the amazing machines, the jets, basically, in Top Gun, that I might be interested in it. But it was just not a, a project. You know, for two hours to watch the movie, great. For two years to make the movie, not for me. That's my answer to that question, if it was a question. Because you mentioned it, but you didn't ask a question. <laughs> See, and now we're down to nine questions. <laughs> so um, what else? Oh, my god. You mean what crimes are in my future? <laughs> I hope many. I, I hope to commit a few more cinematic crimes before I'm finished. Let's leave it at that. And for the actors? Uh, the name Cronenberg, what does it mean for you? Do you want to start? Uh, well, for me, just as a Canadian, um, yeah, there's certain directors on the list that I wanted to work with, and you had made a movie in a little while, and that was just a bucket list director for me, so I've always wanted to work with him, and probably The Fly was the movie that blew my mind as a kid. Uh, can, I, can I do it in, uh, in French? Oui, oui, oui. Merci. Um, uh, je, je, <laughs> Ça commence bien. Um, I'm not starting out very well. C est, c est pour moi, well, for me, David du is uh, a real emblem of the cinema. I've always been attracted to directors who've created a film language of their own. For me, David has indeed uh, created his own style. I was attracted to David's world because I wanted to belong to this universe. And there you have it. Basically, what she thinks of me. <laughs> <laughs> As it is with so many. Non mais voilà, c'était c'était son c'était son son univers. It's his universe that truly attracted me. Vigo, you and David, not exactly a first time. No, <laughs> I've I've been pounded into submission some time ago, <laughs> so I'm a, just a willing slave, basically, wouldn't you yeah. say? Yeah. yeah. Slavery is the, uh, that's the institution that is, is the basis of our relationship. Yes. <laughs> no, it's uh, from the first time we met, I, I appreciated his sense of humor. Well, at first I wasn't sure because it was very deadpan. The things you were saying, we were having breakfast, if you remember. I, I remember it well. <laughs> and he said, well. so what do you think? And I said, and I was thinking, what I was thinking is that well, that it needed a big rewrite. Yes, <laughs> yes <that's laughs> the right. script, but I didn't know if I should say that. Then finally, I thought I'm just going to say. It. I said, I, "It's kind of, it's long, isn't it?" And it's, and you said, yeah, "And it's bad." And I said, <laughs> "Yeah," <laughs> and that's how we started. But you made some jokes. Then I started realizing, yeah, he actually is making jokes all the time. And uh, beyond working together, is the fourth time. Uh, we're friends, first and foremost, I, I feel. And so there, there's a trust there, there's a shorthand. It makes it a lot easier to work because we don't have to waste much time talking and... And, and working. <laughs> and working. No, it goes, it goes quickly and it's always great when there's... Uh, in the four experiences, there's new crew members or in the case of this movie, all except Don, <laughs> uh, all new actors. It was a whole, it's a different, a different world. This kind of story, also, um, but also a, just a different team. And it's great to see how the same thing happened. Seemed to me for everybody else that happened to me the first time, which is, you gravitate toward him because he, you feel that he's open to suggestions. He may reject them really brutally. Um, <laughs> see, that's the most stupid thing I've heard all day. Um, but if it's useful, he'll, he'll take it on. But he's always open to the crew, to anyone, to their suggestions, and he makes you feel part of the storytelling. And with a story as unusual as this one, if you feel like you're alone and you're not part of a group telling a story, it's much more difficult. Uh, the fact that we all were able to joke and appreciate David's sense of humor made it a lot easy, a lot easier. So. I, I should add that after that first meeting we had talking about history of violence, um, 
I phoned my agent and I said, um, it's obviously not going to work. He didn't like me or, or the script. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, but he's agreed to do the movie. <laughs> I thought, what? <laughs> so I thought there was a little misunderstanding. No, it was based on your That's jokes. Yeah, the yeah. script was like crap, but the, the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the jokes were good. Kristen? Mm -hmm. Oh, going last really gets your heart going. <laughs> Honestly, it's like pounding. Um, I think the, the, I actually know the first movie of David's that I watched was Crash, and I was like far, probably too young to watch it, but I'm really glad that I did. I like felt like I was going to get in trouble, which is why I loved it and didn't understand it at all and have sort of unpacked. Who knows, maybe that was a really formative experience. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Um, anyway, so. It's funny, everyone loves to talk about, how, you know, I, I find that people talk about how, that, that some of his movies are difficult to watch, and it's fun to talk about people walking out of Ken screenings. I, every single gaping, bleeding, sort of pulsing, weird image, every bit of hurt, every bruise in his movie, movies, like, you, it makes my mouth open. Like, you want to lean towards it. it. It just never repulses me ever. And so I just think that everything about what he does, and this could be dead wrong, but the way I feel it is through, like, just, like, really visceral desire. And uh, that's the only reason we're alive. This was real little pleasure sex. And um, it's just so honest. And always in a, always in a way that, that allows you to, like, zoom out on the world that we live in. And that's hard to do sometimes. And, and, and um, yeah, I don't know, especially this one. I, I spoke to him on the phone before we just, whatever, before he decided to put me in his movie, miraculously. And I was like, I have no idea what this movie's about, but I'm so curious, and maybe making this movie, we can like figure it out. And I was like, I'm sure you know what it's about, but we spent every single day after work, all the actors being like, what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> like, um, but then I watched the movie last night, and I was like, it's so crystal clear to me. It is David, it's like so exposing, and does feel like you're hacking up organs when you make something. And if it doesn't feel that way, it's not worth it. And I love his movies, and I can't believe I'm here. <laughs> so. Robert, if I may add, you, uh, uh, you know, know each other for a long time now. How is it to produce Monsieur Cronenberg? How is it to produce a film by Monsieur Cronenberg? How did this project? Yeah, or usually. Produce? Well, we've known each other for a long time. We, uh, in fact, we ran into each other on the Croisette back, I think, in 1974. Sure. Uh, basically, we're both homeless. Um, but we didn't get to work together until Crash, uh, probably because there was no other producer in the world who would make Crash. And so that was like last resort. Um, and then that was... Uh, for me, one of the most memorable. For me, it was formative. For me, it was also formative in a different way. Uh, it was an incredibly, you know, it was an extremely uh, memorable experience. And so thereafter, our paths have crossed repeatedly. Plus, we're neighbors. We live about a block apart. So we have no choice but to cross paths all the time. <laughs> all right. So I think we have Rodrigo. A uh, question here from. Hello? Yeah. Question here from Brazil, Rodrigo Fonseca from G Show. I have two questions. Mr. Cronenberg, could you throw a few words about the, the creative process with Howard Shore? And the second question is, I have, this is, the second is for you and Mr. Mortensen. I have a, uh, I feel that two concepts, death and aging, surround the culture of surgery. What do these two words, death and aging, rep represent for the creation of this universe? Could you throw a few words about death and aging? Death and death aging? aging yes. I, I have never heard those words before. <laughs> I, I don't allow myself to think those words. <laughs> Ever since my 75th birthday. We, you know, I'm actually older than the Cannes Film Festival. I want you to know that. <laughs> um, well, I mean, to talk about the creative process is, is a huge, you know, you'd be here five hours from now and I'd still be talking. So I, I, it would have to be a more specific question than that. Uh, and uh, death and aging, well, you know, I mean, it's always, it's in every film, you know, not just my film, it's in every film. When we, we you, you know, as soon as you take a photograph, it's, your, the photograph is of aging immediately. And after aging, death. So, you know, it's everywhere. I mean, to me, what you see in the movie, body is reality. I'm serious about that. That is, for me, that's actually literal truth. It's it physics and physiology that 
what we take to be reality is only, only a function of our physiology, the way our eyes work, our nose works, and mouth work. So um, that means if we are, if a body is what we are, then we are facing aging and death, and that's, as soon as you take a photograph, that's what you photograph. You know, when you, as soon as you look at a photograph that you took yesterday, what is it telling you? Well, if it's me, <laughs> it's saying aging and death. <laughs> Does that answer your question? What was your question? I'm sorry. Yeah. Death, Death what about it? <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll stay with the subject. Um, well, you know, that's one of the things that I, I think I uh, see eye to eye uh, with David about, which is that, you know, we have this time, as long as it is, and none of us know exactly how long it is for each of us, to do things. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with being irritated about the fact that the aging, death, to me as a little kid, I used to wake up, you know, my earliest memories are waking up and, say, and going, uh -huh. and then just getting up and starting running around and doing things. You know, time is short. I always, I always felt as, I resented it. You know, when I asked my mother, how does this work? You know, because somebody died in the family. Does that mean you're gonna die? And she said, uh, well, it's, we don't have to talk about that. I said, no, I want to I want to talk about it. I want to know. <laughs> and she finally admitted that eventually, but not now, a long time from now. I said, how do you know? She goes, well, I just know. I'm like, okay. I said, so I'm going to die too? And she goes, let's talk about something else. I'm like, no, 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 I want to know. So once I realized that was so, I, it's a motivating thing for me. And sometimes I get irritated about it or I'm annoyed if my body doesn't respond the way it used to. Um, as people die around me, or people I know, family. You know, I know it's getting closer, and it's, it's, I would rather look at it in the eye, which is, I think, what he does, and if possible, have a sense of humor about it, which you definitely do. That's where the humor comes in. Everything, even the grimmest moments, especially the grimmest moments of shooting his movies, tend to be the days that we have the most fun on the set because they're just ridiculous things. Even in this movie, when we're doing very bizarre things, mm -hmm. you're kind of laughing, or, or David's making jokes about it, or muttering to himself, you know, and chuckling away. It's like, you know, why not? Why not? So make the most of it, really, is it basically. That was such a downer of a question. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to pick it up. Yeah, bit. I know, you tried to lighten it up. By the way, my mother said the same thing to me as your mother did. What'd she say? She said, um, yeah, you, we're all going to die, but it's not going to happen for a really long time. <laughs> did you say, how do you know? I actually didn't say, how do you know? I thought that that was an acceptable answer. <laughs> I didn't accept it. I was like, yeah. Nah. Well, see, that's the difference between us. <laughs> All right, do I have a question right now? Anthony DeLisandro from Deadline Hollywood. Uh, Mr. Cronenberg, can you talk about the greater social commentary of the film? I mean, here we have these people, they want to kind of have their own rights and do what they want on their bodies in, in the face of this, this, this <laughs> state. And the film's getting released at a very interesting time when Roe versus Wade is in jeopardy. Can you hmm. talk about that? Yeah. Um, uh, it, it certainly does address, in a not obviously political way, the question of who owns whose body, you know? And speaking of slavery, I own Vigo's. But other than that, um, uh, it, 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 you know, I, I did write it 20 years ago, but you could, you could feel, I mean, even then, you could sort of feel that this was coming, the, this uh, kind of um, uh, an oppressive ownership of, uh, and, and, um, control, uh, it's, it, it, it's a constant in history that somewhere in the world there's some government that wants to control its population. And that means, once again, body is reality. What do you control? You control people's bodies. That includes speaking. That includes expressing yourself. That includes your brain. That's still your body. So um, yes, I mean, in Canada, I have to say, and I've said this recently, uh, we think everybody in the U.S. is completely insane, you know? We, th we think the U.S. has gone completely bananas and, we and cannot believe that elected officials are saying the things that they're saying there, not just about Roe versus Wade, but everything else. So um, it, it is strange times, you know? You, we, we think, you know, talking about Putin and the uh, invasion of Ukraine, but then just south of our border in Canada, we, we feel some vibrations that are weirdly similar.
and and uh, you know coming from a different perspective. But so yeah, uh, now the movie is not overtly political, but to me, all art is political, innately political, in that it is it ex it is an expression of culture, of context, of intellect, of a very specific language, and so in that sense, it is it is political, whether the the creator of, of the work is conscious of it or not. Uh, just just to follow up on that, if you don't mind, uh, the it the plastic part of the of the movie. It, can we see it also as a comment on the, on climate change and uh, all the consequences of that? So I say that the it the plastic part yes. of the of the movie. Could we see it as a comment on climate change and this kind of stuff? Well, I'm happy to say that these are all glass bottles, <laughs> <laughs> but this is very plastic. Um, yeah, I mean, 20 years ago, nobody was talking about microplastics, and now every, you know, five days, you have another microplastics revelation, like the fact that uh, we have microplastics now found in the, blood, the bl bloodstream of many people, and the uh, the awareness that about 80% of the people on Earth have microplastics as part of their flesh. So the the, the movie even though, it was, as I say, it was written before that particular word and concept was, was popular, it is, it is posing, a, a, perhaps it's a satirical uh, suggestion, which is instead of thinking that to save the earth we have to stop production of plastics, clean the plastics out of the ocean, clean the microplastics out of the bodies of billions and billions of people, because that doesn't seem very possible. The alternative is that we embrace plastic, that we love it, we enjoy it, we eat it, we find a way to uh, use it as food. It would solve the problems of famine all around the world. And it's, so it's, it's, a, it's sort of a, you know, it's a kind of Jonathan Swift, uh, modest proposal, satirical suggestion, but at the same time, there's some reality to it. Because recently I just was reading about uh, scientists who are, are, are trying to make an edible plastic that will uh, provide <coughs> nourishment and protein because there are bacteria on, on Earth, and these are single-celled animals, but they are animals, uh, that can eat plastic and, and live on it and function with it. So if, that, if it's possible on that level, then it's possible on a human level. So that is one of the, you know, that's, that's one of the proposals of the movie. We well, yeah, have the lady in the second row over there. Hello, my name is Yael Khan. I'm a journalist for the News 24 channel LN24. I think you have been think, uh, I think you have been thinking making such a film for a long time. So, uh, so is it the most intimate film you have made? And if so, what were your inspirations? And for the actors, how did uh, David Cronenberg lead you on this film? Um, the most intimate film. Well. Honestly, I think all of my films are incredibly intimate. I mean, once again, I hate to, you know, pound it again, but body is reality. What you film most as a filmmaker is the human body. I mean, that's what I photograph. You know, almost every shot is of the human body. That's, that's what you're working with. That's you are discussing the human condition on the level of the human body. And there's nothing more intimate than a close-up. So... Uh, so t to me, all of my films are incredibly intimate. I, I, I don't feel distance from them. Uh, how, how, the, how the audience feels about the intimacy of it is a, is a separate thing. But for me, that's it. It's, it's a very, that's why you need wonderful actors who are really not afraid. You know, the, these actors are not, were not afraid. And that's what you want as a director. And it's part of because you are asking for a lot from them. You are asking for an incredible intimacy. Um, the rest of the question was for... How, how yeah, the direction? The, the no, no, inspiration? The, oh. It's inspiration for this? Uh, I, there's no... Um, I don't remember. <laughs> I mean, when I read the script again, when, when Mr. Lantos said to me, well, "Have you? You should read your old script." And I said, "You know why? I don't even remember it." Um, I really didn't. So I did read read it, and then it was like reading a script by somebody else. 
it was like a script that somebody else wrote. A good one, I thought. Hey, it's, it's actually not bad. It's actually not bad. But, uh, uh, and that's often the case when you, when you direct. You are really, it doesn't matter who wrote the script, ultimately, because the problems are the same, whether it's yours or somebody else's. You know, it's a try to make it come alive, make sure that the dialogue really works, the visuals enhance the, the dialogue. Those problems are universal, so it doesn't really matter where it came from. Hmm. That was a part of the question for the actors. How does, it, how does David direct you? How does he direct us? Yeah. Well, I mean, what I loved is I don't think he ever said no to anything I did, <laughs> which is very rare. And uh, he gave you a bunch of space to do whatever you want and try stuff. And um, also, he doesn't really do a shot list. So we rehearse, and then he finds the scene throughout that, and he's not too precious about everything, which gives you a lot of freedom, a lot of bravery to keep going further, 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 which I love. And that's rare, very rare. Um, he he doesn't uh, direct us all that much. He gives us great freedom as actors. I think that with him, we didn't talk much about the cinema. We had like a, more like discussions about um, um, love and life and death. The important thing, the important <laughs> yeah. things. I only make movies to be able to discuss these things with my actors. I believe, though, that David gives tremendous freedom to actors because he likes to see them going about their work and interpreting their character. What else can I add? He doesn't do many takes either. That was a bit intimidating for me. As I was not acting in my mother tongue, I feel very scared. But uh, I think we succeeded. Me, he kept muttering, there was a phrase he kept muttering, and I was like, what language is that? It was over and over, just, and he would walk by and go, what? And he, like, you missed it that time. And then he'd walk by again. I'm like, it sounds like Latin. And I realized it was, uh, he was quoting Sigmund Freud, and he said, si vis vitam para mortem, if you want to live, prepare to die. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> so that's what he did for me. You know. <laughs> it works on most actors. Yeah. <laughs> did it work on you, Christian? Did it work on you? No. <laughs> um, I don't think we did more than two takes of anything. And so if you don't stand on your tiptoes at every moment, you're, you just feel so incredibly at attention all the time, which is a really nice way to be. There's no sort of like, um, there's no wasted space, time, energy, temperature. You should just share this sort of, um, I don't know, Friction, if that's what the scene requires, or a sort of just like balls to the wall, like you better go because you have two takes and this is your only shot. <laughs> um, but oddly, so unbelievably gentle. I don't, I, I, his script is so, this script in particular, I've never read the other ones. Um, it, was, it was such a precision. <laughs> I never feel inclined to learn things like word for word, but it just had such a particularity. I was like, I, I just didn't want to mess it up. I wanted every word to be exact, and um, somehow it was still allowed to really find itself and sprawl. And uh, this person surprised me so much. Like I, um, this is not the first time this has been said, and I hope this isn't totally embarrassingly cliche, but like to laugh at a funeral. It's not just out of discomfort. There's like, if you have, there's a, such an immense capacity for joy. That's why he's able to look at stuff that is hard and difficult and that sucks. And like, you know, all of those always feel sort of like the ratio is equal. And there's just such, like, I feel like when we said his words, he was tickled. He would like come to set just sort of like <laughs> chuckling. And that is such a, it's such a contagious, beautiful feeling. Like, you're like, okay, well, that's, I think that went well. We're talking about some pretty fucked up shit, but he loves it. <laughs> um, yeah. This one time, because sometimes you don't know, you're like, was that okay? We only did it one time. That, that, ultimately, we found out that that was the way to go. But like, this one time he came in and went, well, that was just 
an incredible first fucking take. And I was like, oh my God, that's the most he's ever said about anything I've done in this whole thing. And the, I think I did, office, yeah, yeah. I, I did a mental backflip. I was like, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I remember which shot that was. <laughs> before, before we conclude the press conference, just one quick question to you, Vigo. At the very end of the film, the tear that you have, the crying that you have at the very end of the film, was that something you planned or was it improv? It was something so David planned. <laughs> <laughs> You see, on. that's the master-slave thing. It works really well. <laughs> you will cry now, but one tear out of your right eye only. <laughs> All right, Robert, Christian, Vigo, David, Lea, Scott, merci beaucoup. That was great. That was great. I remember that moment. That was really